special edition, very special edition of the struggle with Candace Thompson. <laughs> Shut up, Donald. <laughs> All right, uh, you guys, welcome back to the struggle with Candace Thompson. I'm Candace Thompson. How many times have I said my name already? And we just started. I'm not narcissistic at all. So anyway, you guys, the struggle uh, for my new listeners. Thank you for joining. The struggle is a podcast where I invite my friends on. A lot of the times they are comedian. Most of the time they're comedians. But you know, sometimes I venture out, and I I don't want to make it exclusive to just comedians because they're not the only ones who are struggling. So I have my friends come on, which is uh, what's happening today. But anyway. Uh, we, we have this podcast, I want people to relate to something that they're struggling with, and if we can make you laugh about it, then that's we did our job. That's all. Just to brighten your day a little bit. To my loyal listeners, thank you for coming back. Um, if you have not subscribed on all podcast platforms, we are there. So wherever you want to go, wherever you listen to podcasts, we're there. So subscribe. Make sure you go to YouTube to watch videos and rate and review us on iTunes. That really makes a difference. But don't rate if you're going to give us a bad review. Just rate <laughs> for the five stars only, right? The bad reviews, save that for Yelp. All right. So, and also, uh, if you've been listening to this and you haven't told somebody, tell somebody, pay it forward, and tell them about the struggle if you're enjoying it. You can find me on all social media, Jokes by Candace, and CandaceThompsonComedy.com for my shows, which I update very infrequently. <laughs> 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 now I'm going to introduce my guest for the day. Um, this is a special episode because we've we've had a very rough week. I would say most people in, in not just even the country, I would say the world had a. Who, if you are a basketball fan, you had a, a rough week. Um, so I've got my friend Dr. Donald Grant, who is a psychologist. <laughs> Dr. Donald Grant, capital P, lowercase H, capital D, <laughs> PhD, here to because I want to talk to you about some stuff, because, th- again, everybody's been dealing with a really rough week this week. So yeah. welcome, Donald. Where can everyone find you on social media? Uh, I'm at Dr. Grant Jr. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Follow him, guys. He's got some nuggets. I've got a few. You've got some nuggets. And now, I mean, Donald, I have to, I do like always saying one of my – when I remember to do so, I like saying how I met the person that's on my podcast just so people can get – like, oh, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet. <laughs> We met back in, I think it was 2005? Uh, yeah, yeah I think so. I think so. We've known each other for 15, 15 years? 15 years. 15 years. And we met through a friend of a friend who knew I was moving out here. And he was like, my best friend and his wife are out there. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you got to link up. So yep. that's how we met. And we've been friends ever since. But I will say this. I, you guys have been, you and Erica have been married. You were married before you moved out here, right? Uh, we got married the year after we moved out here in 2004. We got here in 03. You got here in 03. So you yep. got here a little bit before me. Yep. But I will say this, that I have resented you guys the whole entire <laughs> time that I've known you because you guys are happily married and you're normal people. You're norm- You're not in like, you know, I'm surrounded by entertainment people, right? right. I'm surrounded right. by crazy, loony people. And so I leave the responsibility to my normal friends who are not in the business to recruit possible people for me to date. And you guys have not come through at well, all. I have did, resented you. You did go out with one of my really close friends He's trash. Quite some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that out. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, put it in there twice, actually. No, he's not trash. He wasn't trash. We just we were young and it, it was it didn't, work. it didn't work. It was long distance and whatever. But that you didn't hook. That's how I met you was through him. <laughs> that was the reverse. I'm talking about. All right. So it is on my agenda. Agenda. Now it's now 15 years in. He's 15 seen. Years. He's seen me be single, it's and he's struggle. like, you know, <laughs> thanks, Donald. <laughs> how do we? So is this your starting struggle? Is this the struggle you're starting with? No, this was not. This was just me letting people know who you are. <laughs> 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 Through who you are. <laughs> this was me wanting people to know how selfish you and your wife are and keeping the love all to yourselves and not being like, you know what, Candace could use? A good man. I got you, son. Yeah. I got you, son. Twenty twenty. Now that I'm all old 20, and my right. ovaries are shriveled up. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. Well, no. Now that's documented, I got it. <laughs> how great would it be if we were on a podca- podcast in four years from now? And you're pregnant with your baby from your husband that I introduced you okay, to. Okay, first of all, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. have never said I wanted a baby. <laughs> I didn't, say I didn't even did. say I wanted a husband. <laughs> I just said I wanted to meet somebody. <laughs> <laughs> did 
I go too far. You're jumping way ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. A, I don't that's think I'm a marriage years. person. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I don't think I'm a marriage person. But anyway, no, that's everybody. We're not. Everybody's not. Everybody's not. And you that's are correct, fine. and that is fine. You have to be okay with that. I might. I might adopt some. Some a person. Yeah, a adult or a kid. A person. I don't want to say a kid necessarily because there are a lot of te- commit, there's yeah. a, there's young there's preteens that yeah. don't have homes that yeah. and you know they get the shaft because nobody wants yeah. them because yeah. they're you know so. I used to work in foster care for LA County and the um, kids who were teenagers particularly teenagers of color they'd be the ones who aged out of foster care of meaning course. they were not adopted of course. prior to them turning eighteen or yeah. twenty one in LA County so yeah so yeah I'm open to that all right all yeah right, all I'm, right. we'll see. All right. <laughs> We'll All see right. what the future holds. We'll invite you in a little Taekwondo. Over. <laughs> I love his name is Taekwondo. Well, I do ethnically stereotypical <laughs> names <laughs> when giving th- examples. And so, uh, if is we that to s- normalize the name so that people don't think that they're not really I outrageous? Like to have the context and for to activate people's implicit bias. That's what I like to do. Okay. Get closer to the mic. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> As we activate implicit bias. Yeah. I uh, Already he's using (laughs) big words, doctor words. Two really small words. No, I know. (laughs) 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 Have you ever talked to anyone this stupid before, Donald? No. I I would like to know that I, I I would not like to know. I would let you know that you have a very soothing voice. Hmm. So I think you're in the right field. I appreciate I, you're make, that. You make people feel very comfortable. I appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> now, let's get into my struggle, which I think, again, I mentioned this earlier, is has been a lot of people's struggle this week, which is why I wanted to have you on specifically, because you are a psychologist, and you, um, you, know, you know how to deal with people who are grieving. And also, you are a black father. Yeah. So this, uh, I think, affected, and, and the age group. Like, we, you know, we grew up. Absolutely. With Kobe, yeah. right? We grew up seeing him. Like, I remember him going to prom with Brandy. Yep. Like, yep. I remember when Aaliyah died, mm-hmm. and it was like, what? And even then, it was, like, shocking because, you know, she was so young. But he, this is not, this is no better. No, it's not. It's not. And we, I was having a conversation with somebody. In fact, I was at a bar that you told me about because we had your bir- you had your birthday party there years ago. Oh, which one was it? The Woods. Oh, the you still go there? I do. It's I a do. great bar. It's a great, I love a good dive bar. That's and so a great I was bar. there the other night and I was talking to this guy. He wasn't a football fan and he was in some ways describing how he was flabbergasted that people who didn't know Kobe was moved by his passing and he just couldn't understand and so we're sitting there drinking cheap whiskey and having a conversation about how people might be impacted by somebody they don't even know who they never even who they never even knew and so I had cousins and friends texting me saying oh um, what is it like in Los Angeles right now and I said you know there's there's a gray cloud you can feel it across the whole city like we're all in our cars by ourselves but you look over to the left or to the right in traffic and you see people feeling some kind of way. I mean, these intricate murals were popping up overnight. I mean, people were so inspired. Right. And so when you think about an icon, and it's not just about him being just an icon, it's about people who have changed the landscape of something. Um, and the human condition relates to that. Like when we go through an experience change, it, it's hard and it's tough. And so watching somebody be able to actually come into a space and create significant change. Remember, there was a huge gap in NBA excitability and um, not necessarily prosperity, but excitement surrounding it right. for a while after Michael Jordan. And so right. Kobe for many Who's people, the next one? Who's the next one? Kobe for some people was their introduction to the NBA. Um, Kobe again for many people uh, was this kind of Huxtable character who was breaking stereotypes for Black America because he spoke like three, he languages, spoke three languages, lived in Italy, lived in Italy. You know all these things that they say Black men weren't particularly Black men in the NBA weren't right. Right, and right. So if we juxtapose Kobe and Allen Iverson who came right. in the league similarly, right? Right. Um, and I went to Hampton University in Virginia, so Allen was always on campus playing basketball right behind my dorm. Um, I had know. the biggest crush on him. <laughs> I mean, uh, should have went to Hampton. Kobe too. I should. <laughs> Does anybody have a time machine? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, and so 
there's space for every representation of man in every man of color, right? And so right. I'm not saying Kobe was the right and Iverson was the wrong. I'm no, just of saying course. heretofore, all we had was that. Was more Allen Iverson was more stereotypes. Allen Iverson right. stereotypes. And so for many people, Kobe came in and he was iconic because of all those factors. And I heard a news, uh, a journalist say the other day, when the front of the jersey matches the back, it's synonymous with the back of the jersey, that means something. And so when you think about Wayne Gretzky, when you think about Michael Jordan, when you think about Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, their franchise, their franchises were really, really them in many ways. Yeah. And so it wasn't just about this dude dying. It was about this dude who impacted so many people in ways they didn't know until this happened. Yeah. Now you add on to it that his daughter, daughter was, was a part, part of it. And all those and other all those people. Other, all those and other and people there's, there's three kids, kids on there. Yeah. yeah, yeah and a family. There was a wife and a father. Wife, father, wife and a, a husband and a wife and their daughter. So And, daughter, they're, and yeah. I think they have other kids. They have two other kids yeah. going to understand. One who's 30. Um, and so hopefully the 30-year-old will be able to care for the um, teenager that was left behind. But um, th- those are losses that you can't imagine. And so in addition to his own... Um, iconicness, which I don't think is a word, but I'll tend to make up words and I'll do you it. You on more. the struggle, Donald. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be keep it as formal. We make up words all the time. Let's do it. Let's do and it. And my listeners are so stupid. They don't know. <laughs> I love you guys. I'm kidding. am not endorsing that comment. <laughs> Neither am I. I'm kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> um, and so, so when you bring that family context into it and say, oh, shit, man, this, this, this woman just lost her husband and her daughter, daughter. and she just had a brand new baby. baby. That, that means something. And I, I, unless you're a sociopath, the human condition has to connect to that. She has to affect you in some yeah. way, shape, or form. Yeah. You won't necessarily be crying in the streets. But yeah, no. To be reflective. And that's, that's what I think I love about it is that it's forced people to be so reflective. It's forced people to say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm working so much, but, you know, tonight I'm going to work on a puzzle with my kid. Um, or tonight when oftentimes my son will ask me, I have a 10 year old son and he'll often ask me, say, um, you know, daddy, can you lay with me for a while before I go to sleep? I'm like, no, I, I got to finish this. I, yeah. I, I'm working on this. I only got two, I got a deadline. And so, um, you know, being mindful about doing that and not letting it be autopilot. I mean, obviously you can't do those things every single night. There's things to be done. Um, but you can certainly be mindful and say, you know what? Yeah. 10 minutes is not, not going to deal. it's not gonna it's not gonna make me miss my deadline and if it For does sure. if it does there was some other shit that i had that, uh, hadn't that you done. didn't do yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah so so i mean it, it, it's so impactful in so many ways yeah like it was palpable the day that that happened i walked out well i was yeah. in shock and just you know glued i can't remember a time i was glued to the television as much as this except from 9-11 yep. when 9-11 happened also Katrina, when that was happening, yeah. I found myself, but even more so, like, this reminded me, it was like a 9-11 feeling. Like, what? I had to turn the channel. It I, was. I had to, I had to, I had to literally, literally turn the channel, I said, because I'm just consuming all yeah, of this. Yeah, all of it, and it's too much. Yeah, you get in the car, because our local radio stations, all they're doing is having of call-ins of and course. people reflecting on stories, and they're wonderful stories to hear, um, but consistently consuming that can, can you know, cannot necessarily be healthy all the time. No, I can tell, you know, I I don't know, have, have I ever talked to you about like manifesting and meditation and stuff? Yeah, like, I don't know if yeah. we've like thoroughly talked about that, but like, you know, you consume that and you, it does affect you, that energy that you're taking and then you attract things with that, you know, it like attract like. So like if you're consuming all this negative stuff, you start to attract negative stuff in your life. And I think at one point, and I don't know if this is, real or not but i think it is i was watching i had to watch what i watch now because i'm a big crime of passion (laughs) forensic files and you wonder why i hooked you up yet (laughs) (laughs) there's a darkness inside of me donald is what i'm trying to say kylo ren kylo (laughs) i'm not gonna ruin it if you guys didn't see the new star wars but anyway too late did you see it i did yeah anyway you said too late i didn't say anything I didn't say nothing. Did you not? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but so like there was a point and I and I don't know what it is because I'm I'm a genuinely happy person. Like I'm always happy and I'm always grateful, but there's something in me that makes me want to watch murder. <laughs> like it was Christmas time and I was watching John Benet Ramsey's documentary. My manager came over and was like 
<laughs> is this is how you celebrate Christmas? <laughs> I'm like, I watch it every year. No, and I. <laughs> there's no time of year that I'm not. I'm not opposed to watching. Some people a watch crime. A Christmas Carol. Some, Some people, people watch Law and Order SVU. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here's yeah. the thing: those aren't real enough for me. So <laughs> I really don't enjoy those as much. I like the real gritty, like forensic files. Like this really happens. Yeah, I investigation discovery channel. You the first forty eight. No, that one I actually haven't watched. It's pretty good. It's I like good? It. It's good. It's good. It's good. Is there closure at the end, or do they leave you hanging? There's usually closure. There's usually <laughs> um, I don't sometimes like non-closure. the case doesn't close, and so they <laughs> oh, can't close it for you. See, I don't. <laughs> it's real cases. I though. don't like that. Cold cases? Uh, no. no. I don't, don't do want that. anything. No, I need to know You're who very did this. Specific. I'm very specific with my murder. <laughs> <laughs> But what, during that, and what we're talking, and the reason why I got sidetracked is because when you're saying that consumption of that, is I realized, like, I had to stop watching so much of that stuff, because that was around the time where I, I had a peeping Tom. Like, I had a mm. guy coming to my, oh, I remember, and yeah, I remember yeah. being like, why, what am I putting out <laughs> that is, I have some guy at my window, hmm. and then I stopped watching it as much, and oh, and I would watch it the worst time, too, right before you go to bed. That's They true. say do not do that, because those images, those graphic, those visuals will stay with you, Absolutely. and it's all about manifesting and whatever. So well, it's so real. Like, I think about that about reality TV, yeah. all these housewife shows, oh God, and yeah. people just watching people fight and Yeah, argue. you're going to attract drama. It's, it's ridiculous. I heard uh, Lupita Nuago do yeah, yeah. an interview about her role um, in 12 Years a Slave. And she said that it took her months to get out of that space because she had consumed so much of that darkness while she was, you know, inhabiting that role. And I think she was nominated for it. She, she won. Yeah, she won. Yeah, she Oscar won for, for that. It. And so when you think about that process of having to immerse yourself in, in trauma, it's tough. And so some of for us sure. do it on purpose without getting paid. At least you got a check. You, you know, we do it. We don't get right. paid for it. Right. So I'm just saying that to say when we're talking about like, self-care, honoring Kobe for those who need to honor him in a certain way, it doesn't mean that you got to sit and listen no. and, and take in everything. Yeah, you don't, absolutely yeah. you don't have to. It yeah. just made me, and then I've noticed, and I don't know if you felt this also, and I don't know if people listening have felt this, but I thought, like, the first day of hearing the news was going to be the worst. And for me, it was not. Mm -hmm. Like, it kept growing. Like, I didn't even, absolutely. I didn't cry the first day. I think I was in shock. Yeah. And I was like, this is like, this isn't real. And then no. as the days go by, like I I bawled my eyes out like two nights ago. And you would think like, as you know, they say time heals all wounds. It's like <laughs> not three days, Candace. So I was <laughs> right. still, but it's just growing. It's yeah. mounting and it's not going away from me yet. Yeah. yeah. And I can imagine what this feels like, you know, for, like I said, black men, uh, brown men are in our age group yeah. that grew up with him, looked to him, up to him as a hero and an icon, and somebody that made that gave them hope. And yeah. it's like I I know what I'm feeling is just a fraction of what, because I didn't even I didn't even follow sports. I don't <laughs> right, right. I don't I'm not I didn't follow basketball. I don't follow any of it. Right. And it still like you said affected me because um, yeah. I'm human and I'm not a sociopath. <laughs> well, I mean I know I may be a sociopath with all the dark murder well, stuff I watch, but well, yeah, I, that's another. I, I don't episode. have my DSM five with me, but that's the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Oh, I'm in there. Um, oh. <laughs> 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 I'm in there for sure. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in, anyway, I, I do think that for uh, black men and men of color, e even subconsciously, we're we're presented in a, in a particular light. I just released a book in October um, called Black Men, Intergenerational Colonialism and Behavioral Health, A Noose Across Nations. And it's a study that I did. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. I wanted A Noose Across Nations to be the primary title, but the publisher wasn't with it. They said, of course not. <laughs> you don't <laughs> say. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a study I did on black men in the UK, the US, Canada, and France, showing how all of our outcomes are very similar as it relates to over-incarceration, yeah. under-education, yeah. poverty, so on and so forth, and how colonialism contributes to that. When we talk about people like Kobe Bryant, I understand that, you know, he had his flaws, and we can't minimize, you know, the cases that were charged against him. And I want to honor those women. And I their did want to bring that up. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. so that's that's real. Um, but nobody's nobody's perfect, right? And so that doesn't minimize that. But it's a both and. Uh, we can talk about this in the same framework. We can talk about 
um, that piece, right? Yeah. Uh, and so um, it's not like Bill Cosby, and I hate to bring that up, but that's a different. It's a different con. story it's we're different talking story. about. It's not the same. People who are comparing the two. It's a whole different you, story. You sound crazy. They're you not sound the, ridiculous. You're not the same at all. You sound ridiculous. Yeah. And so I'm saying that to say. Because Cosby was innocent. <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean that. I did not see that coming. Um, <laughs> Correct. So, Continue. So even when I talk about the show, I call it the Huxtables because I need. Because you need to it not say. It was an important it. show. Yeah, and so it <laughs> was an important. Sh- and I'm. Yeah. Can I talk about for a second how mad I am at like for the people that worked on that show who are oh. no longer getting residuals? Absolutely. And uh, Elvin. <laughs> Jeffrey yeah. Owens, I think yeah, his name was, is. Yeah, he was in Trader at Joe's. Trader Joe's. A, I mean, he was making a life for his family, doing what he had yeah. to do. Yeah, and very humble um, and very like oh, okay a, with it. Because a lot of actors turn to drugs and stuff like oh, that yeah. when they when they're like, oh, I can't yeah. go back and work. I can't fly coach anymore. And those like, people that tried to shade him really created an opportunity where he actually got more work. And I think Tyler, he started. He's working with Tyler, working with Tyler Perry, Perry yeah, right? Yeah. Which is just you know, is a step above Trader Joe's. Uh, but I don't know. You see his studio. I have, but I've also heard rumors of him not paying people well uh, at all. I've heard that too, but yeah. we we don't know that to be accurate. So we I know people that worked for him. Oh, who there it is. You do yes. know it to be accurate. I do. Um, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm no Medea. So here's another example, right? Yeah. I'm no fan of Medea or any of that. Right. Any of that franchise. Right. But what I do know is that as a result of Medea, I know a lot of my aunts who would have never been to a theater before. You know what I mean? And so right. When we look at all these different iterations of black men um, across the diaspora here in the U.S. and across the world, mm-hmm. um, the images and the ecology created ha- has been very, very oppressive, both in a kind of esoteric way and a tangible way. And so you got to do like Kobe, who was by all accounts this amazing dad and who coached his daughter's um, basketball team, who kind of was creating this model of breaking the misogynistic tropes yes. inside yes. women, f- female basketball, yes. right? Um, t- he talked about pay equality. He he talked about his daughter, you know, transcending the league. Yeah, and which, da, da, da. which spreads out to much broader than just basketball. Huge. Like, that's affecting women who have, like, uh, girls who aren't in sports at all. It's just Absolutely. you're giving us confidence to, to feel like, especially girls of color. Yep. I didn't get told all the time, like, you can do this, you can do whatever you want. Like, I never got told that. Nope. Nope. So, like, he's giving hope to not just, yeah, girls who are trying to get into sports and excel in that because that gets shit on all the time yeah. and disrespected. Yeah. But he's, you know, that spreads much broader than that. Yeah, but it's, it's huge. And these girls, his daughters are, I mean, they're, they're at the intersection of two hugely found, frowned upon minority groups for, in, in America, but for particularly sure. here in Southern California. Because she's they're, Mexican. They're Mexican and black. Yeah. And so they're holding on to that intersection. And this man, for people who look like him, his wife, and his children, um, you know, he's promo- he was promoting a lot of really great stuff. Um, and so when you think about those representations and how we don't get those, um, that, that, I think that's one of my main struggles is operationalizing how all these black men can exist in the same space at the same time and be so different. Yeah. Um, Yet, what the media wants to promote to us is a particular the same thing. It's a particular image. So, like, let's say if you did a an analysis of all the black men who have won um, Oscars right. um, for a leading role all in four Hollywood. Of them. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. So they're about like seventeen nominations, and so you got Sidney Poitier who won for Lilies in the Valley, and so you know the whole magical Negro trope, right? Of course, we swoop in and we save the world, and then we disappear. So like, think Bagger Vance and Oda Mae Brown helping on a white person achieve their goals. Yeah. Meanwhile, that was my whole purpose in life was to help this white person, yeah, so my whole and then I can die afterwards. Can die. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we got Morgan Freeman and Sidney Poitier winning for roles like those. Mm-hmm. We got Louis Gossett Jr. Winning for being this hyper masculine, homophobic black dude. We got Denzel Washington training winning day. for training day. But when he should have won for Malcolm X. When he should have won for Malcolm X. So I should say, guess what they don't win for? Malcolm X. They don't win for that. Morgan Freeman not. played the hell out of Mandela. Of course. Um, of course, he didn't win for that. And then you had Don Cheeto in Hotel Rwanda, who oh, was yeah, nominated, yeah, yeah. didn't win didn't for win that. It, of course. Um, then you have Will Smith. I didn't see Ali, but. You know, uh, you know what? Acting, I never saw that either. People said his acting was questionable. He was nominated, but he didn't win. He but didn't win. All those men are figures of black men who stood up to white oppression very deliberately. In Hotel Rwanda, it was all about a system of colonialism set up by Europeans, and this man was fighting against, against that. Against it, right. Um, Malcolm X, we all know what he did. And so these, those men 
are not celebrated, yet all these other images um, are in fact celebrated. And so when we look at, again, um, just to bring it full circle back to Kobe, when we look at uh, what he did and how he just kind of promoted this other image, again, none of these images are bad. There was nothing bad about Allen Iverson. It was just what was promoted disproportionately. For sure. So I never saw myself in this space, right? I, I never saw my existence in media or in film or in TV. And yeah. so um, it's important. It's important. It's very important. I um, I just can't, can't help to think, uh, well, did you, you probably didn't watch the Grammys over the, um, the same I, day. That I watched some of them. Yeah, I watched some of it. I, uh, I, my friend Joyelle was in town, another comic. She lives in New York, and we were watching some of them because we were like, we got to, because we were like you, watching all day Kobe. <laughs> we were like, we have to, to get a break from this. And I had to perform that night. Oh. And I was just like, and then I thought about the phrase. I was working, Garrett, you know who Garrett Morris is? Yes. Older yes. black dude from SNL uh-huh. back in the day, but mm-hmm. has, a ste- has had a steady career. Anyway, he yeah. does, he used to have a comedy club, uh, the Downtown Comedy Club, which does not exist anymore, but now he still does like twice a year. I think he does like a Garrett Morris comedy show. Mm-hmm. At this venue, he's hilarious. Uh, he's ridiculous, he's and hilarious. he's still kicking it. Like he's eighty three, I think now. What? Yeah, he's eighty three now. But and he loves me. Oh, he always like says to me, "You know, I'm the one that's gonna have to take credit when you finally like <laughs> pop, Candace, because I discovered you." And I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> sure, Gary." But I did the show with a couple of other friends, and uh, uh, I was thinking to myself because I was not in the mood. Mm-hmm. to do stand up. Yeah. I was not. Yeah. Like I didn't want to talk. Of course. And so I thought to myself like and I even said it on stage I was like, you know, this has been a very rough day for most of us um you know, but the show must go on and while I was up there I was like, why? I felt like, why must the show? Has we really, really dissected this phrase? It's just a show. Why? Why must it? Yeah. Why must it? Can we just take a day off? Maybe a week and just chill, just cope with what's going on. Like I was like, if I collapsed right now on stage, would the next stand-up comic come up here, step over me, be like, "Where my Scorpios at?" Like, no. We should we should probably stop the show. Sometimes the show has to stop. Sometimes. <laughs> I agree. It's such a ridiculous phrase. And it's always dealing with entertainment. Like, there's no reason why in entertainment anything needs to go on. For it's, I agree. It's, it's just postponing it. Do anyway. You really have to keep going? Yeah, comedy is not going anywhere. <laughs> right. We'll be here tomorrow or next right. week when you decide to reschedule. Right. Um, I do want to. Let me. Yeah, yeah, don't, for don't, sure. Don't lose your thought I on won't. that, though, because I do want to say that. Sometimes the show must go on as a part of the healing process, though, right? So oh, absolutely. There were people there that night who needed to get their minds for sure. off of that. And so you provided them with a space of respite for, for an sure, hour yeah. or for 30 minutes. And you had to push through your own shit to be able to give that to the, the world. Joy. I'm um, a, what the can I say? I'm a humanitarian. <laughs> but even the late night comedians, they, they um, absolutely. I, and the shows are taped earlier, I believe. Yeah, they, they are. They, like did a segment to open up the show. I think Jimmy Fallon did it. Like he had like an empty audience to say, I wanted to tape this. Kimmel, I think too, didn't have an audience or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so they they, they honored that, but also honored the fact that, you know, people need people need space. Well, I I do think that uh, The Tonight Show is probably more of an institution than Garrett Morris's once a year, (laughs) twice a year. (laughs) But no, there were people there and they enjoyed it. And you know, you're absolutely right. The show does have to go on in some situations because yeah we have to look past ourselves and be like yeah. i'm suffering right now but at least i can bring joy to i'm it. suffering so all y'all go suffer, suffer too. too yeah no i'm just gonna stand up here and cry for 20 minutes how about that i prepared a slideshow <laughs> <laughs> ah, so ridiculous i do want we got to get into your struggle so um we can transition but i would i, I did want to address the the kobe you know, we're talking about his character and, you know, he's a complex person. He's human. He's made mistakes. And because, you know, a lot of people gave him oh, crap. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you were on Twitter at all, then you saw oh the God. awful people One coming out. One girl was like, he's a rapist. Why are you crying? And I was like, whoa, that escalated quickly. Uh, it's <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, let's also point out that it's usually a white woman. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't know. <laughs> There was no women of color doing this at all. I would always, mm. I also like to point that out. But someone spray painted rapist on one of his. Wow, I yeah, didn't see that. Yeah, That's yeah. Awful. And here's the thing: the only people that will ever, ever truly know what went down exactly in that room are him and her. And I'm not saying I'm absolving him of anything. You know, mm-hmm. he knows what he did. He did some uh, inappropriate things, but at the same time. It, like we talked about, it's different from Bill Cosby. Like to call him a rapist is so harsh because I, 
that word to I call Bill Cosby a rapist. Unequivocally. A and, serial rapist. Yeah, right. And I don't feel like Kobe is that at he's not that at or was that at all. But at the same time, it's like you're saying someone's not redeemable. You're saying someone couldn't and obviously you see the way that he was with his daughters and how he coached women and like or girls. It's like Yeah. I think he's shown growth and that he could change. And I do think that he was remorseful about what he did. Yeah. In addition to that, what I don't think is really ever discussed is, have you watched this HBO show called Euphoria? No, but I've seen billboards for it. It's with Zendaya. Zendaya. Okay. It looks young to me. It so. is young. <laughs> Very troubling. And as a, as a parent, I would advise I should, you I not check to it watch it. Oh, no. don't watch it. Okay. Because you're I've like, never seen it. you're like, this is what kids are doing. <laughs> no, it will. And I think it is obviously an extreme version right, of what, right, but at the right. same time, I, kids are doing some trifling things yeah. that would make you as a parent like you're not leaving the house until <laughs> you're 18. Right. Ever. And so there is a scene that I wanted to bring up that happened. Um, I don't remember what episode it was, but there's a scene where there's an athlete. There's a black kid who is in college now dating his white uh, girlfriend who is still in high school. I mm -hmm. think she probably is a senior Anyway, they're in a scene where they're about to have sex, and then they're in the middle of having sex, and he's choking her, and she can't, she can barely speak, and she's just getting, and he can't hear because she can't speak, and then afterwards, and and we're not, they're a couple. This is not like they just met. They know each other. They love each other. Mm -hmm. There is a relationship between the two, and he's still doing this to her, and at the end, she says, why did, what the fuck were you doing? Hmm. I couldn't breathe. Why would you do that? And he says, I thought that's what you wanted because so many kids are watching porn. Yeah. They, they, they think that that is what women want. They think that that is normal sex. Yeah. And so I couldn't help but relate that. I was like, there's also possibly that, that could have been a factor in just not knowing how to treat women in that way or thinking that's what we wanted. And it was just an honest mistake of uh, and miscommunication with what went down in that bedroom. So... That and again, none of us will ever know. No, we won't. We won't. And we 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 honor the voices of survivors of sexual For assault. For sure. And so that's not even in any way what this conversation is about. And I believe that men, as a result of historic uh, historic tropes of misogyny, have been trained to be disrespectful to women. Absolutely. Programming that shows women tells men and boys how to treat women. Um, and so it, that's no excuse, that's no reason for anybody to um, disrespect a woman. But what we know is that... Now, she burns your meatloaf. <laughs> that's a whole nother. Ain't nobody got time for burnt meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got to get the comedy in there every <laughs> once in a while. But anyway, we do. continue. So, no, so, you know, it, it's, it's a very, very complicated uh, system that we live in with so many oppressive factors that we definitely... Um, need to be aware and pornography for ha for generations um, has been giving young adolescent boys a misguided view of pro-social healthy sexual relationships it, right. it, it, it has done a well let me not say a bad job it's done a wonderful job because much of it is purpose for that it, it's purpose to maintain to do that right misogyny and right. so so l call a thing a thing it, it, it's doing its job see and I never even thought about that I never even thought about the intent of it. I just oh, thought yeah. it was such a huge money maker that they're just like, this isn't going to go anywhere. We just got to keep making it. Mm -hmm. But I never thought that yeah. it was created with intent. But Absolutely. that obviously makes perfect yeah. sense. Absolutely. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I've been doing a lot of, I'm a systems guy. That's why I don't practice psychology anymore. You know, I'd sit in a room with somebody and we yeah. talk about the same shit week after week after week. And I'm like, well, I told you what to do last week and you still ain't do it. I'm glad to and know so that that's <laughs> as infuriating to me, a person who's not trained in this at all. <laughs> I'd be annoyed. I told you what to do. I'd be annoyed as hell. And so I was like, you know, I, I can't do this. I care about the systems that make people hurt. Yeah. Um, and how do we impact the systems that make people hurt so they don't make people hurt anymore? Right. But for me in the micro system, the one on one, it didn't work for me. That's why that's why I it couldn't was be too a frustrating. Yeah. It, it, was, it was frustrating. And, and it's such an important relationship. Yeah. What I knew was that I'd be doing a dis and I was really good at it, but I'd be doing a disservice to them right. and myself by by staying, staying there. by staying in that field. But the learning was great. The work that I did um, to earn the degree and how it's con how it contributes in other places 
um, just this depth of level of understanding human behavior. You can't, you can't buy it. Right, well, it's priceless. Right. I guess you can buy it. I well, you can. <laughs> he, you know, I went to school. He's like, I went to school. So I guess you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> my student loans are like a small. I'm raising a small family in Atlanta. You somewhere. still got student loans? Oh, are you kidding me? Absolutely. Yeah, it's the cost of a small condo yeah, in Georgia. That's so ridiculous. It's dumb. It's dumb. It's dumb. Let's not get into yeah, the no, whole that's another po- scandal. podcast episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. but think about that for a second. Education, what? systems yeah. of education. We're talking yeah. about systems deliberately created to oppress people. Yeah. Education. Institutionalized. Yeah. 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 If you're Oppression. rich, if you're rich, you can buy your way in. Yeah. If you're not, you can acquire all these loans that are going to right. kind of disrupt your life into your forties. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Swallow that. Now we've s- <laughs> we have <laughs> we have we do have some time, so I would like to get into your specific struggle. And you hmm. came in, you had you said you had a couple, and we were like, which one? Yeah. I want to leave that on you right now. What do you feel? Okay. Because there was the issue of you said um, we talked about being a black dad in general, yeah, the struggle yeah. that that comes obviously with the territory, but yeah. also. Uh, being a black man in psychology, yeah. what it means to be black in psychology. Yeah. And yeah. wait, what was there was one more. Being the only black man in the room. Being the only black man in the room. Um, yeah. Which I find myself often to be. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that's the struggle I'll pick for, okay. for, for today. Okay. Since you um, are the only black man in the room right now. <laughs> Look at that. We <laughs> talk about manifestation. Woo. Uh, so... <laughs> um, it's interesting. I am. Uh, I do lots of lots of different things. Um, but one of the things that I do is I'm an equity, diversity, and inclusion practitioner and, I'm, and a trainer. And so <laughs> he's one of these guys. You meet them and you just roll your eyes. You're like that. Hey, you and your long business card with all the words on it. <laughs> Why is your resume 32 pages? <laughs> Um, so because I got five hundred thousand dollars in student loans, that's why that's I'm gonna tell you. Exactly I'm gonna tell you exactly what I went exactly to school for. Um, I I consider myself a kind of entrepreneur in the social um, impact space, right? And so people think that if you get into the helping profession and the helping fields, it's all philanthropic and altruistic. Yeah. Um, I always tell. I used to tell students when I was in the classroom. I want to save the world, but I want to do it wearing Ferragamo. I'll come to terms with my materialism, and I'm cool with it. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so. So wait, do you have a do you have a uh, an opinion about these pastors that like are pushing? That's M- different. <laughs> that's, that's a little different. That's a little different because they taking them ties and they. <laughs> they <laughs> how you go buy a Maybach with somebody's ties? Um, and that's ties. T a t a t i t a t s. There's an H in there. Yes. Um, and so uh, I, I think I think that's different. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about people sending in money. Like you watch it on TV and you send in money to get prayed for. Yeah, um, yeah. That's how do you know they even praying for you? You sent your money in, you got nothing to show up for it. Yeah, you ain't got no receipts. Yeah. no prayer that's receipts. That's not like this is bad, but that's kind of how I felt. You know, the feed it, feed the children. I didn't trust mistrust the kids, obviously, but I mistrust <laughs> I mistrust the organizations a lot of the well, time. But now you have now there there's organizations that they have all of the data, right? And so, so you can see where you your can money see what what percentage is going to the overhead of the organization. Like if 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 fifty percent of your donation is going to the CEO of the organization and how much is actually yeah, 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 around. Yeah. So you can see that now. But these churches ain't showing up. Ain't, ain't showing For that. sure, they and know so, having it. Have um, <laughs> I, I do remember going to one church in Gardena, and it's a huge mega church, uh, City of Refuge. Oh yeah. And the pastor, he would always I think say, "I've been there." You probably have. Um, the, the pastor is actually Grace Jones's twin brother. Has he always been the pastor there? I was gonna say, has he always? I thought you were saying, has he has always, he always been, been Grace there? Jones's <laughs> twin brother? He has always been a pastor there. Uh, and they look exactly Bishop alike. Bishop Noel Jones. They look alike. They look she alike. She doesn't look. I mean, they could be. She, you know, she's very masculine in her look. So it's like yeah. they could be twin brothers. I, I don't know if she's ma- she's androgynous. Oh yeah, androgynous. Um, yeah, but yeah. she does have a masculine jawline. I'm not taking that back. She d- I just watched it. I love her. First of all, she's wonderful. She's Pull up wonderful. to the bumper, baby. She anyway, grew up in Upstate. I grew up in Buffalo. She grew up, they grew up in Rochester, I think. But anyway, so I remember I remember him saying in in service one day, um, you know, I don't want none of y'all putting y'all rent in the collection bucket. I don't want you going yeah. hungry because blah 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 me. blah. Right. So I do think there's a space where some churches have created a really great business model and as a result 
the CEO or and or who might be the reverend of the church is gaining financial benefits as a result of running a great business. Yeah. I also think that some of these cats are taking advantage of some sure. of these poor parishioners of color. And For so sure. I think it's a both end. I've seen some great work coming out of churches, yeah. but then sometimes I'm like, mm. there's some. There's you, you, you was a pimp last week. Well, we just said people can change. So. People can People, oh, people are redeemable, for sure. <laughs> Some of them, not all. Some people are trash. I say that regularly. Yeah, hey, hey. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. One of my one of my major struggles is 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 oftentimes being the only black guy in the room, and um, you kind of know what you what you sign yourself up for, right? And so I knew that by signing myself up for you know this degree program and moving into this specific discipline, um, that I would be amongst people i mean if you think about the number of black men who have um doctoral degrees right uh it, it's, it's a fraction of a fraction yeah uh and so it's I slightly knew. more than have black men that have oscars <laughs> slightly. <laughs> slightly more <laughs> um and so i knew the company that i'd be getting into right and so i knew that when i put my son in a small private school uh with high tuition and a wonderful wonderful program I knew that most of the families there were going to be white. Of course, uh, yeah. We're one of the one of the very few monoracial black families in this wonderful school, um, and so I knew that when I went to work for you know L.A. County, I'd be surrounded by people of color. But as I ascended, I was surrounded by more and more white people, and these are people running um, systems. And so, when I think about the number of times I've been asked. Uh, Donald, tell us what Black America thinks. Tell us, tell us what your people think um, and from graduate school <laughs> forward. And I guess maybe this is the consequence of going to a historically Black college. <laughs> you, you, you end up forced into this purgatory of yeah. um, of representation. Being the represent yeah. representative of mm -hmm. the entire race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was um, keynoting a conference last week in San Diego or a couple weeks ago, um, and. It was it was a great uh, it was a great conference that they had San Diego Office of Education, and the room was primarily white yeah. um, teachers, administrators, uh, really great open open to learning. And so, I open up my talk with you know some of you are going to be up here are, are going to say oh this dude is up here attacking white people. It's about eight hundred people in the room. I said the reframe is I'm attacking white privilege. There we go. And so being an equity and diversity dude, like, professionally, and being six foot whatever and 200 whatever pounds, yeah. having a bald head. Right. right. That's, the, that's what we call, what they would call, you're not a non-threatening <laughs> black <laughs> man. I'm not a non-threatening black man. Yeah. So um, I... I, I, I'm phenotypic. I look like the stereotype of a black man. Yeah. Uh, and so I come with all those things, and I put them on the table. I, I, I say that to people. I say, I, I, I know that as a result of what I look like and what I'm saying, you guys are having a, rea a reaction to it. My business is Mindful Training Solutions. That's the name of my business. And so I open everything up with pay attention to how you're feeling about this, right? And so note that you are feeling real dysregulated and you want to get up and walk out right now. And making people uncomfortable in these spaces is a really, really, really tough balance, right? Yes. Um, I feel like what I'm saying is so important to get them, because they're educators, right? When yeah. you talk about things like bias and white privilege, we're not talking about the barista at Starbucks not being able to spell your name right. right. I right. mean, that's different, right? right. Th than a, a teacher as a result of their their stereotypes having low expectations for children of color and then educating them based on that low expectation, wondering why that child doesn't excel because you're not enriching them. And you don't know that you're doing it. You're not doing it intentionally. Right. But if you don't pay attention to the fact that when an individual is not anti-racist, they are racist. They are racist, and yeah. And that's a tough one for people yeah. to swallow. Yeah, from a From a black dude. Okay. I can't consider myself a big black dude, but from a black dude. <laughs> but it's true, and those, and I think that, I think people just hear the words racist, yeah, and they just get all in their feelings, and they're like, no, <laughs> yeah. I am not, I'm not. Instead yeah. of just taking that uncomfortability that you feel right now, sitting yeah. with it for a moment, and dismantling what it is in your head that made you react like that, That's and just it. and just listen. That's just it. Just listen. That's it. That's it. We've been so conditioned 
to take care of white people yeah. and to take care I mean any, any dominant group like when we talk about um, the LGBTQIA plus community yeah, yeah. Um, you know they've been so conditioned to, to make heterosexual people feel comfortable yep um, women have been so conditioned to make men, men feel, feel normal feel right. normal and comfortable yeah. and so we have to begin like you know, fight, fighting this because yeah. otherwise it's just going to keep going downhill. It's still going to be rape culture. It's still going to be all this racism and discrimination. I mean, they had to pass a fucking law in the state of California that says you cannot um, discriminate against natural black hair. What? Like, why was that necessary? What? Why was that necessary? necessary? Besides the fact that people with afros and dreadlocks and kinky hair we're not getting jobs because people looked at them and said, said oh, I can't have this in my establishment. Mm-hmm, the customers mm-hmm, won't come in. Mm-hmm. Right. No, they, they, they won't come in. They, right. They, they won't come in. And um, in fact, I don't think you're smart enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Dabalina said he's going to pass on you today, Shaquanda. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming in, though. We appreciate it. Seriously. It's sad, <laughs> but it's sad, but it's true. These are it this is. Is the reality. It is. And people, I, I feel like one of the biggest problems is that people – fail to acknowledge that it's true, right? So let's talk about... Because it makes them feel bad. Absolutely. It makes them have to be responsible for and, t- and be a- acknowledge their actions and, and realize that they have been part of the problem. White fragility yeah. is real. Yeah. Um, and so, wh- like, for instance, we've all been taught you don't ask about salary, right? Like, if you walk into... If you're somewhere and, you know, a, a place like L.A., everybody's asking, you know, what do you do? What do you do? What, what do you do? Yeah. But nobody, you don't ask about salary. And people don't realize that we've created that to be, like, um, inconsiderate or rude to ask about salary. But it's created deliberately as a trope of misogyny to maintain the pay inequality, the pay gap, the gender pay gap. So that when, you know, Karen and Richard are in the break room... Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever hear Karen ask Richard about his salary so that she never knows that he's making making four times more than her. Absolutely. Doing the same job. I I just listened to I listened to Ted Radio. I don't know if you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just it's a more produced version of TED Talks. If you ever watch those on YouTube. And so they'll have they'll pick one topic uh, or uh, and then have like four different excerpts from four different TED Talks Mm. all combined into one radio show that's in an hour. And there was one, there was a guy who was talking about, I, we have meetings now. I'm forcing people to say what they make because yes. it's opening this conversation. And that is what it reinforces is that the women are going to continue to make less. People of color are going to continue to make less. That's right. Women of color making the, le- the least of all of them because we're both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Intersectionality is real. Is real. And, 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 and you are making less. I mean, in fact, the state of California had another law. I mean, we're we're pretty progressive out here, so yeah. we're we're actually leading a lot of a lot of things. But we had to pay a, pass another law that says, for those of us who have traditional nine to five type jobs, that when you go on a job interview, they're no longer they're no longer allowed to ask you what your previous salary was. They're no longer allowed to base their compensation package on what on you what were you making when made. you left because if you are in one of these out groups yeah. a person of color a woman whatever it is you're already making less year over year over year over year as a result of these pay gaps yeah. and so when you move to another job if they base their compensation um, package you, on what you made the, the small amount you made right you're still going to be subject to that oppression right. and that that kind of systemic oppression so again another law to help break this system of pay inequality right yeah well i feel i feel in a similar way i mean because you know we're both doctorates or (laughs) see if you were you would not have said it like that (laughs) well what i said what's the correct way to say it i can't tell you oh that's 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 between us like the secret fraternal handshake. Ah, it's like the Illuminati. <laughs> I uh, I can relate to what you're saying. Like when you say you, you're in front of white people a lot of the time um, and you are making them com- uncomfortable. I do that. I also do that with my comedy. Yeah. I, I talk about race. I talk about, and sometimes I'm in front of the whitest. Yep. Like I perform regularly at the comedy store. And like there is a mix there of people, but it's mostly white most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time. Um and on certain nights, it depends on who's on the show. Like if I'm on a show and it's got and it's a Joe Rogan show, and I know most of his fan base, it's mm-hmm. gonna be mostly people there for Joe Rogan. 
that's going to be an interesting like he, I, I and there's certain jokes I tell just to just to, just do to it. yeah because yeah, yeah, like yeah. you need to hear this right now because then it's gonna make you so mad but <laughs> I just need you to hear this yeah. right now and yeah. you could feel like the air gets sucked out of the room I when I'll it. say certain things I love it and you just say slavery <laughs> <laughs> and immediately you it's ain't like, gotta get no context yeah, you just say you know, it. just say it <laughs> just walk out there what's up slavery motherfucker <laughs> and then. <laughs> But it's so na- like I I actually not that I I to each his own. If you are an artist out here and you're just not caring about what your influence is on society, and and that's just what you do. I can, I'm not here. I can't change you. Mm-hmm. That's whatever. But I feel that I've always felt a social responsibility, yeah. you know, to make change or to make people think about situations differently, change people's perspectives. Yeah. Um, whether or not I've done that with my jokes, I have no idea. I, I, I've gotten some emails from people. Say, can you do a survey, like a post-show survey? <laughs> Her, any of you that were racist when you came in, do you still hate black people? Or is, did I change your On mind at all? On a Likert scale from 1 to 10, <laughs> rate yourself when you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> rate your hate. <laughs> rate your hate cards. Rate your hate. <laughs> were you a, maybe an 8 when you came in and now you're at a 6? I'll take it. I'll Boom. take it. Boom. Success. <laughs> so, yeah, I have just always felt like I'm not here. I am here to make people laugh, but there is a way to do that that also makes people think and think about their behaviors and think about what they're putting out there and if they're being productive and uh, just being kinder to people. Yeah. And, I don't, again, I don't know if I – but I have had, I've had a chick – I talk about abortion, too, sometimes, mm-hmm. and I had a chick tell I've me – I've heard that, actually. That when we came oh. out to your show, uh, I, rem- I remember that joke. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't been. I've been my. I actually had a goal one time to do 15 minutes of abortion material, and then I, I was like, I don't know if I need to work on this right now because I was working on another late night set. They're not going to let me talk about that on late. So I was <laughs> like, let me dial. This, I'll save it for uh, my special that I'm going to be working on. But anyway. I was like, heard that drop. No, oh, no, I mean, special, I'm just special. manifesting like that. I don't have a special right now, but an album is Coming soon. probably going to come soon. And it, <laughs> who has the time? Anyway, <laughs> with this, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> Again, <the> incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get an, I got an email to my website one time. This chick was like, I, uh, I had an abortion, and this was the first time. Hearing that joke was the first time I was able to laugh about it. Hmm. So wow. thank you. Wow. And please don't stop telling those jokes. Love it. Love it. So yeah, Love but it. like again, and in that, con- uh, there were times, you know, as a like you think, and I'm a comic where you're, you're hearing something, you're like, this is making me uncomfortable. Yeah. But if yeah. there's a point to it, then you know, that's it. Ma- this is something that I'm I feel uncomfortable because it's they're speaking to me right now. Yeah, that's right. It's like like when you and I, 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 this is my like third example about church. Like I go to church every Sunday. Um, but like when you're in church and a minister's talking about something, he's like, "Oh, just dude talking to me." Suddenly you in the bathroom because you're scared. Cause but because um, <laughs> you think he's Jesus a witch. Coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I I think that is kind of for me where I am deliberately making sure it stays top of mind. So I I, I work in higher education, and so we'll have conversations about retention rates for students, and I'll say, well. What are our retention rates for our black students? What are we, what right. are we doing uh, about that? Right. And uh, I, I, having to consistently, you know, wave that flag holds a heavy weight, right? It, it holds. Uh, it, there's a burden associated with consistently having to bring up issues as it relates to your own personhood, who people are are, are looking over or yeah. not necessarily having any empathy to, right? And so you. You are a professional in the space, and so you get hit with all the data and research that says, "Oh, black men are dying from this." Black, and, and you, you know, you're cons- we were talking about consumption earlier, and you're consuming all that data consistently, and then you're immersed in, in, in organizations, uh, whether it's for work or activities or, or whatever it may be. You're immersed in these organizations that give you more feedback on how people don't care about the problem because right. you have to be the one that consistently says. What are we doing about this? How are we absolutely? To that? Yeah, um, and there, there's a there's a burden associated with it. I mean, I, I'll take it, but should I have to? Should we have to? Um, should should right. I have to be anxious before I do a speech to a bunch of white people right. about you know attacking white privilege right. about attacking white privilege or talking about weapon? One of my favorites is when I talk about weaponized white women tears. Um, 
please don't get me started. <laughs> That's it. Please yeah. don't get no. It's it, it, we we we've, we've seen so many examples. Um, Emmett Till. It's listen. All of the black Wall Street and and like towns that were burnt down as a result of a false accusation. Right. Um, we were just talking earlier about respecting the voice of survivors of sexual assault. Right. Um, and this is in no way connected to that, but we have a long history in black America of white women creating false accusations that have resulted in our demise. Yeah, and um, y'all still love them. <laughs> 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 Dr. Grant does not endorse the comments <laughs> from this podcast. I just want to be clear to know that was the comedian with that one. It was the comedian. <laughs> but I, I, I've I, talked about this. I've had a, I had a black male comic come on and talk about just like relationships between. Because yeah. we see that. And, and I do know that it's not the majority of black men that are with white women in this country. I do know that was a misconception. Mm -hmm. But. You know, when you live in L.A. and like large places, yeah, large cities, you, you do see, see. And and also the images that are in the media when you see it's usually like it's like athletes and people that are at the next level of like there's entertainers that you don't that that are the black men that you see with women that are not black women. And they mm -hmm. it, the media loves that. Oh, oh the they, media they, loves that. They eat up. But let's be let's be clear. And I. I you know, marry who you love. For sure. Um, as long as they're of age to consent to the relationship. Marry for love. 100%. Marry, marry who you love. And I will add that it's going to be, I hope this comes out the way I intend it. White women have been created as the grand prize in America. Yep. And when you look at a certain level of success, in order to seal that success, you want the highest prize, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Right. I can remember um, what my grandparents were talking about when they moved north the, during the quote unquote great migration. And, you know, you would buy a Cadillac. And you would drive back down south, and everybody's like, "Oh, you up there balling?" They yeah. say balling because it was like 1965, but whatever they said, whatever that word was <laughs> for that, you up there killing it up there, huh? <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, what what we've been convinced or told is our mechanisms of success, or, or what represents success. And so, I'm not saying that that is the case for all black men who are not. dating a woman outside of their race, but I want to be very not. clear to say yeah. um, that there is a subconscious. Um, halo yep. placed on the heads of white women yeah. intergenerationally and um, it can't be denied. For sure. They can deny it. I've heard them <laughs> deny it. But. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's the shit you got to yeah. talk about for people to understand. To just listen. This is why we. This is why our space exists as it does. This is why when people saw Kamala, but oh, she's so aggressive on the mic. Is she, though? Or is she just not is this? Is she just not? Yo. Yeah. I I was at work the other day. We I know this. We have so much to talk about. We have got to wrap this up. But I was at work the other day, and somebody that I was working with went to my went to a, like a, a superior and said she yelled at me. <laughs> she yelled at her. Oh, it wasn't a white woman. This was a this was a white man. Yeah. Who said who told my superior that I yelled at him, <laughs> and I did not. And I mean, and and this was like this is not a for debate. Like there was a bunch of people around us. So yeah. like if I'd yelled. Other yeah. people would have heard it. <laughs> yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm loud. I'm not a yeah. quiet person. <laughs> but like, and it, I immediately was like, I I went up to this guy and gave him advice about something that he was doing wrong and told him because I cared about him mm -hmm. and told him what he needed to do. And he took that as yeah. she's yelling at me. Yeah. And it, I couldn't help but wonder and whether or not this was his uh, motive or not. Was, was it be because I was a black woman, am I am, am yes. I'm speaking to him in a certain way? Yes, it was because you were a black woman. Even if he's not able to acknowledge it or n even know it, like people are moving and they don't. You don't even know. That's what implicit bias is. You don't even know, know you're that you're operating doing it. On. You have right. no idea. You've been trained to do it. When right. men objectify women, they're not intent for the, in many cases. They're not intentionally making you an object. Yeah, no, they just think they've that's what... They've been taught to do it. They've right. been taught to do it. Yeah. They've been taught to do it. And women do it to other women. Oh, God. Black people do it to Awful. other black people yeah. because the toxins in the world and cycles of oppression impact everybody. It's like dropping bleach in a fishbowl. Right. It's going to impact everything, everything in that fishbowl. So we got a lot of work to do. And I think we solved it in this hour. <laughs> Boom. <laughs>
<laughs> Donald, thank you for coming today. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. This I'll was a very. I'll be back. He will be back. I will, <laughs> I'm gonna have him back because I, like I said, when I say when I say that I want my comedy to like reach people and like you know it will change, then that also is part. Of, I mean, this podcast and I have a podcast talking about people's struggles, and it's like I don't want to not help, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I think I've been doing all this time is not helping, but also again, laughing is help. So Absolutely. it's therapeutic. It's so yeah, no, I have I haven't done more damage than good. <laughs> I don't think. Okay. But if you're listening, call in and tell me. No, we have no phones. I say that all the time. We have no phones. There's no phone line. But anyway, Donald, thank you for coming. Once again, where can people find you on social media? At Dr. Grant Jr. on both Instagram and Twitter. And what's the name of the children's book? The children's book is called A Moon for Us All. It will be out in February, and it is a historical fiction novel based on teaching about black history. It follows a boy and his family on their travel, and you learn about black history intertwined with um, American history the way it should be um, yes. through through this book. And I'm hoping that families will be able to read it together and really um, get a good lens. And the title is based on the fact that no matter where you are in the world or what time in the world you existed, we all look at the same face of the moon based on the Earth's rotation and the, and the moon's rotation. That's so. beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, guys, uh, follow. Make sure you follow, follow and support Donald. He's fantastic. Thank um, you. If uh, again, if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, we're on all podcast platforms. Wherever you listen to them, uh, YouTube, subscribe there. Rate and review us on iTunes and pay it forward. Tell somebody if you learned something or you laughed at something. Tell somebody about it. Till next time, bye. <laughs>